<laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for February, what is it, 8th? 2013. Yeah. Uh, so today we've got a whole bunch of cool stories. Um, we're going to talk about, where's my list? Here we go. Uh, the failed search for extraterrestrials. Uh, an amazing video and graphic on uh, M106, the galaxy. Uh, curiosity drilling away and a weird metal thing found on the surface of Mars. The mighty year of the comets and a supernova precursor and whatever it is that Alan wants to talk about. What are you going to talk about, Alan? Well, I can talk about uh, asteroids or the Death Star. Ooh, astero- are you going to talk about the asteroid that's going to get yeah. really close to the... Okay, mm-hmm. good, done. That sounds great. Okay. So, joining me this week, uh, in no particular order, are Alan Boyle from NBC News. Where's your... Where's this, Alan? No, 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 this. Oh, this. this. Oh, this is I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Amy I thought I changed it up a little bit. <laughs> Hello. Amy Sherry Title from Vintage Space. We've got Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. Nicole Gallucci, doc, sorry, Dr. Nicole Gallucci from uh, the, the Noisy Astronomer from CosmoQuest. We've got Dr. Phil Plate from Bad Astronomy and Slate, Slate Magazine's Bad Astronomy. And we've got Dr. Thad Zabo from Cerritos College. Hello. Awesome. All right, well, let's get started then. And now, before we uh, get into the stories, just to let everyone know, you can always uh, ask us any questions and uh, sort of drop in your comments and feedback. There's about a zillion different ways that you can do it, so we'll try and watch all of the places. <laughs> you can use Twitter if you like that. Just use the hashtag Space Hangout. You can, if you're sort of watching this on anyone's comments on Google+, Plus, you can uh, post a comment there. If you're watching the event page, you can post your comment there. Um, Oh, and by the way, I shared a whole bunch of sources to you, Nicole, if you want to pick them I all up. I added, yep. Okay, great. Um, and, you can, uh, and you can also post a comment on YouTube. And I recommend sort of the safest places to post a comment on YouTube. So if you're watching this video embedded somewhere, you can always click to watch it on YouTube, and that will bring up within the YouTube area, and then you'll see all the comments there, and you can post your comments or questions there, and we'll try to sort of integrate your comments and questions as we, uh, as we get through the show. So, <clears throat> so... This week, uh, there was a ton of SETI news and extrasolar planet news and, uh, and sort of a weird, depressing or happy story. I'm not really sure how to, how to put it. So, uh, Nicole, do you want to talk about the, the uh, sort of where we're at in the search for extraterrestrials? Sure, sure. So SETI, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, did its first uh, directed campaign. So they, they looked at uh, candidates uh, for, from the Kepler mission. So they've been looking for extrasolar planets with Kepler, looking for Earth-sized, Earth-like-ish planets. Uh, and they uh, finished that search with the Green Bank Telescope. So, of course, one of my favorite telescopes ever um, in, in West Virginia. Uh, they did a search between 1 and 2 gigahertz, if you know what that means. Great. If not, it's cool. Um, and they found nothing, sadly. Uh, so I think they, they looked at um, something like 86 different candidates. Uh, and they, you know, as you usually do when you're doing some kind of radio astronomy search, they found 52 candidate signals. All of them turned out to be false alarms. So, of course, even though they're in the radio quiet zone of Green, of, uh, Green Bank, West Virginia, they were still getting uh, human-made signals, which uh, showed up. So the, um, I'll put a link to, uh, actually Ian O'Neill covered this for Discovery News. I'll put a link to that in the, in the Hangout in just a minute. And uh, it also links to the preprint of the published, of the, of the journal articles so you can actually dig into the details of that article if you want. Um, so that puts a, a limit on how many, um, yeah, they, what is it, like less than 1% limit on, on uh, planets that might have um, some kind of radio communicating extraterrestrial species. But obviously this is a small sample just getting started on the directed, um, directed campaign like this. So I'm holding out hope. <laughs> I'm holding out hope that we're going to talk to E.T. in my lifetime, um, but that's just me. Uh, but the first directed search has come up with nothing, which is sad. But it's strange that it's, you know, like, is it, you know, on the one hand, I know, Nancy, you worked on a story for Universe Today, and it was like less than 1% of planets contain, could contain extraterrestrial civilizations. That actually sounds like a big number when you consider how big the universe, you know, how big the Milky Way is. Yeah, so, but that's a limit. Less that's a than limit. Means it could be anything below. Right, and a directed zero. and an actual yeah. directed search t- didn't turn up anything yet. Right, right. So, do you think this is going to have any implications on funding for the SETI search? Well, SETI is already not funded by federal budget. <laughs> no, so I, I know, I know. Imagination, 
Um, I don't know. Right now, uh, I know the ATA is being funded privately, and so they're still looking for donations. I think they're still looking for donations in that in that realm. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think uh, as long as we get the message across that this is a first targeted search, that this doesn't kill everything. Um, that that shouldn't hurt its funding prospects, but it's our, it it uh, unfortunately already got got the slap by Congress uh, a few decades back. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Oh well. Wah wah, very sad. <laughs> wah wah. <laughs> wah wah. Aliens, um, was, aliens call us. All no aliens. Um, uh, also interesting, using the Green Bank Telescope, uh, I was there a year ago, a little over a year ago, when Frank Drake, uh, who did the first SETI search 50 years ago, uh, did a SETI search using the Green Bank Telescope to mark the 50th anniversary, and he didn't see anything either, but it was kind of a big media event with uh, everybody in, in the control room, so that was pretty cool. But still, you know, like like I'm saying, you know, don't uh, lose all hope because even that that number, that one percent, is still billions yes, of least, planets. If, so yeah, assuming that we we have how many they're they're estimating how many billion planets just in the Milky Way, I wouldn't get our hopes up for contacting anybody outside the Milky Way. Yeah, um, but even that could be a big number. So it means there are four billion. Was it four hundred million stars in the? Milky Way. Anyway, billion, four hundred billion. Four hundred billion. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of life. So it's confirmed. <laughs> confirmed. Lots of alien civilizations. No, no, um, limit, no, limit. no. Wait, limit no, that's not, not how that works. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, let's move on. So, Phil, you've got a, a cool story, and I, I think uh, on the cool galaxy M one hundred six. Yeah. This is uh, when you first look at it. Uh, this picture of this galaxy. It's a gorgeous spiral galaxy, a lot like the Milky Way. It's about 25 million light years away, which is, eh, you know, kind of close for these sorts of things. Uh, so it, it, we get pretty decent pictures of it. Uh, Fraser is displaying a, uh, a Hubble image of it that also has uh, uh, on top of it uh, some extra data that shows gas. Uh, hydrogen gas tends to emit in the red part of the spectrum. And so where you see red here is gas. And Underneath it, you see sort of the, the yellow center of the galaxy and the blue arms. Uh, that extra red stuff, though, is a little weird because it's not actually tracing the spiral arms that we see in the galaxy. Uh, and when you, this, uh, when you look at another picture of it, which I think I also sent, um, which is a Spitzer and uh, infrared and Chandra X-ray telescope image. Uh, it's not Fraser. It was Nicole's feed. There we go. Yeah. Um, if you take a look at that, that shows them even better. You're really seeing that there's sort of a normal spiral galaxy with weird stuff going on. So I've got, of course, as always, my Milky Way spiral galaxy model here. And you can see it's very flat. It's a disk. It's got the central part, and it's got these spiral arms. So you've got sort of these, these normal spiral arms, but then you've got these weird ones sticking out in M106. What could be causing that? Well, it turns out that in the center of every big galaxy is a supermassive black hole. We have one in the Milky Way. It's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. Well, M106 has one that's 30 million times the mass of the sun. It's actually fairly beefy. As stuff falls into that black hole, it forms a disk. It gets very hot, and it can blast out jets. And the direction these jets go is usually sort of up and down relative to the galaxy. But what we think going on is that they're actually coming out at a very shallow angle, so they're actually sort of burrowing their way through the disk. And as they're doing that, these jets of matter, which are moving at incredibly high speed, and they're blasting out gamma rays, x-rays, all this high-energy light, it's exciting the gas. It's warming it up and making it glow. So what you're seeing here is a galaxy like the Milky Way, except that black hole in the center, actively eating stuff, blasting out material, plowing into stuff in the galaxy and lighting it up. Um, it's pretty cool. We've seen stuff like this before in other galaxies, but uh, as far as I know, uh, never in one this close and with such detail. This, this sort of anomalous arms, as they've been called, have been a mystery for a long time, but now we're pretty sure that's what's going on. So hopefully, mystery solved. So uh, one thing, and I think we're all hearing it, you seem to be a Gua old from uh, Stargate, Phil. Uh, your voice has gotten very deep, as if you're like speaking some kind of... I don't oh, know. is that happening? That uh, you know, I, there's something going on with my system when I record stuff. It makes me sound like Apophis. Yeah, you totally sound like Apophis. Yeah, okay. So, um, all hail Phil Plain. Kudos to Jens who commented yeah, on that. Yeah. Exactly yeah. what I was Jafar thinking. Kree. 
<laughs> so you're so not I'm just not, stuffed up. There's yeah. Like, so I'm not sure if you if you if you filled the room. What's that? You know that gas. You know that makes you sound. Oh, you know, sodium hexafluoride. Yes. Yeah, so you filled the room with sodium. Yeah. You might want to get out. Get out of the it's room, my, Phil. It's my yeah. voice sexinator, I believe, is the <laughs> software I'm using here. Oh, oh we, have a, we have a good question uh, from Alan Curlin for Phil. Uh, if black holes absorb everything, even light, how do we see these, these ejections that are part of the light spectrum? Right, that's a very common question. It makes perfect sense because that's what you hear. Black holes draw everything in, and it's sucked down into the maw of this thing, and it's gone forever. But what happens is the material comes in. It can form a disk before falling inside the black hole. Black hole only draws things in when they're very close. So outside of that sort of point of no return, you can form a very hot disk called an accretion disk. And this can be a lot of material that gets very hot, um, up to a million degrees. It gets scary amounts of energy because magnetic fields and friction and craziness. And that's what happens is then that stuff can get so hot, it wants to expand like, like hot air in a balloon expands. But it can only expand out the pulls of the disk. So in a sense, if you ignore that this is a galaxy model, think of this as now a black hole in the center, you get this disk here, and stuff will shoot out the top and the bottom. And the direction those jets go depend on the tilt of the disk. And in this case, instead of it being perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy itself, it's almost at like 60 degrees or something. So those jets are plowing out right into the disk of the galaxy and heating all of that gas. That's how we're seeing it. That's really great. And yeah, we get that question a lot, right? How can anything fall into, how can anything escape a black hole if a black hole can absorb everything? So um, it's just, it hasn't reached the black hole yet. Yes. Pretty much, yeah. It's outside the yeah. black hole. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so now, but there was a video. I don't know if you saw it, Phil. Someone had posted this video. I think it came from ESA or whatever, and it was zooming in to M106. Somebody had kind of composed sort of M106 into a larger field. I'll, I'll try and dig it up and send it to you because it was a really wonderful picture. It was, it was I a have video. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, it was great and sort of gave that more context of, of, of the overall environment. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, thought, I, I was sure you had seen it, but if not, I'll, I'll dig it up for you. Cool, thanks. Uh, all right, cool. So we're going to go to Nancy now. And Nancy, you're going to be talking about Curiosity rover and the strange things it's finding on Mars and the, uh, the drilling that's going on. Right, yeah. Uh, Curiosity did its first actual drilling this week, uh, dr drilling uh, the first test hole with its uh, a drill on the end of the arm. So that's pretty exciting. Over the last weekend, they used the hammer and kind of knocked a piece of, of uh, the rock off, and, and that worked fine too. Um, the kind of interesting thing on the pictures, I don't you know, okay, somebody's showing them, uh, the rocks appear gray on the inside, and so this, the red dust that, you know, the red rocks or red, uh, you know, color to the rocks are actually just, it appears to be dust on the outside of the rocks, and, and the inside of the rocks are gray, so that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, they did the, the first drilling on, on Wednesday this week, I think, and uh, like I said, over the weekend, they did use the hammer. Uh, you know, so this little drill hole is pretty cool. You know, it looks like a drill hole. <laughs> and uh, uh, the name of the rock that they put it in was called John Klein. And it's just a perfectly round hole with the, the rock shavings or whatever you call them um, visible on there. So it's, um, it's really neat. And they haven't said too much about it yet. They did say that their observations of this rock is, uh, is much like... Uh, you know, other rocks that they've talked about where there appears to be indications of at least, you know, of, of one or more episodes of, of a wet environment in, the, in uh, creating this rock. So that's pretty enticing. Uh, the drill hole that they did was about two centimeters deep, and uh, this drill can um, go down about five centimeters total. So they just... Uh, did did a, did a smaller hole to start at first. So, and then the other weird thing that we reported on was uh, kind of a shiny metal-looking protuberance coming out of a rock by Curiosity. And uh, one of University Today readers uh, sent this to us, uh, Elisabetta Bonora from Italy. And uh, and she and I kind of estimated that we thought this was really small, like about a half a centimeter. Um, but I see the guys at unmanned space flight said this thing is probably uh, over three centimeters tall, and I'll I'll take their estimates over mine. So it's actually a little bit bigger than than I was expecting. Um, to me, it looks like uh, the Manamana guys. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. That was the first thing I thought of. It's like Manamana, and uh, so I don't know what this thing is. But we've gotten lots of suggestions of what it could be. 
uh, a handle to open an entrance below the surface. Uh, another person said Richard Hoagland's bicycle. Uh, or uh, more interestingly, it could be part of an iron meteorite. But I don't know, it looks like it's coming right out of this rock. So, team, you guys got any suggestions of what this well, is? But I mean, has NASA said anything about this yet? No, and I've, I've, uh, I've written to, to JPL and nobody's responding, so I don't know. Well, I uh, got into a little thing with a Martian flower uh, a few weeks ago, so I'm going to stand pat <laughs> until, <laughs> until somebody else uh, to makes a suggestion. But uh, definitely there are, are a lot of weird features, and, and, uh, but once uh, the geologists come up with an explanation, it doesn't look so weird anymore. So it'll be interesting with this one because this definitely looks weird. Yeah, you know, uh, Stuart Atkinson, who is, uh, he writes the Gale Gazette, and he does a lot of uh, image editing and that kind of thing. I sent him the image. I said, what do you think this is? And he said, um, you know, he, he said all sorts of things of what it could be, and uh, but we ultimately decided that, yeah, when they tell us what it is, it's going to be really boring. So. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. But... But it's it's strange to me that they haven't, uh, I mean, not conspiracy strange to me, but just strange to me that NASA hasn't at least come out and, and provided a bunch of possibilities. I mean, this is a pretty interesting feature, and I'm sure they would be moving the rover over. I mean, is the rover still nearby, this thing, or was it just something that they happened to take a picture of and then just kept moving? I mean, can they come back and take a look at it from different angles and try and figure out what, you know, drill it? Yeah. I think they're still right there because it, it's. I think it's nearby where the drill hole is. So, yeah, I think they're still there. Drill that uh, that piece of a that alien artifact and uh, you know, see what's made of. Yeah, it looks metally. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's I want to cool. jump in. Say, so be very careful when you see pictures like this. The color and the the ref what what looks like a reflection of sunlight makes it look shiny. It may mm -hmm. not be. It could just be something that's that's brightly colored and or bright. You know, sort of whitish. And so it's reflecting a lot of sunlight, and that look makes it look shiny and metallic. It's very, very, very tricky to interpret pictures like this. So, mm -hmm. you know, with yeah, the especially when, picture, there's, the when they're zoomed in like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, to actually you see really it, it's zoomed need to in. See it from a different angle, different exposure time, stuff like that, right. so that you can really get uh, an understanding of what this is. Yeah, so well, they, they did take a picture from both the left and the right mass cam, and so there is, we did add a, a 3D version on, on the. The website on the article that we wrote. So it and I'm gonna go look at that now. It was it was even more perplexing after seeing the the 3D anaglyph. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, and I you know I'll defer to you, Phil, on uh, on how that is, and and the guys on unmanned space flight, if if they want to uh, comment on what they think it might be, they're just uh, they're they haven't said too much so far, but uh, they're they've been looking at it. I'm scanning back now. Uh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we'll keep you posted. In here or in the uh, event? Oh, the for the 3D. Yeah. Okay. Hang on, just a <laughs> I've sec. I've got these. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help the rest of us. Yeah. That if anybody is... wants a, a pair of these, I highly recommend. I ordered a pair for like like actual like sunglasses ones for 99 cents on eBay, and they're they're great. And so whenever I need to look at a 3D anograph, I just pop out these uh, glasses, and you know they look great. Yeah. It's a handgun. That's what, you, that's that's what you've decided. Obviously, conspiracy theory. Oh, NASA, help us out here. Okay, there it is, Nicole. Thank you. Okay, I'll share that. Yeah, out. there's a big pic, the big one on Flickr. Yeah. Is there? You know, it just looks like it looks like a rock. It's, it's just catching rock. the sunlight. Yeah. It's but doesn't it look like a strange protuberance on a rock? Hey, well, there we are, could do this. There, we could do this all day. That's so true. Why don't we, is that a hint? Okay. We're, <laughs> let's here, Amy. On. Amy, you want to borrow my glasses? <laughs> oh, my, mine are out of reach. I'd have to go digging. Oh, there you go. Do have but, some. Okay. Every got mine from the doctor. Everybody watching right now, go to eBay. Something. Get yourself a pair of these glasses. They are so many great pictures in space and astronomy that are done as these three D images, and you want to have those glasses nearby. Mine so, are not at my desk. Get some right now. No, mine aren't, mine aren't in arm's reach either. 
Mine are in my it. Landscapes of Mars book, fittingly. Yeah. So if, get any a pair. Wearing, if any of us were wearing pants, you'd see us standing up and looking around. <laughs> <around. laughs> Since none of us is, they're not going to see I'm it. Yeah. Pants. Nobody's going to yeah. go out of their way to try to find them. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up the pointless speculation. We're going to move on to the... Uh, to so fun to pointlessly speculate. I know, I know. We could do this all day, though. This is the problem. People need yeah. some kind of news, some kind of professional <laughs> journalistic focus. Um, so, Why are they watching this show? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We're, the, we're all the got. Um, so, Amy, we're going to talk sad. about the year, the year of the comets. The year of the comets. Well, I'm going to talk about... Yeah. Comets of years past a little bit more. Um, so, so kind of the intro to this is that Comet Ison. I don't know too much about it, so if anyone's got details, please jump in. Um, it should be seen during the day in November, and this is this is kind of neat. It's going to be close enough to the sun that it's going to be bright enough to actually be seen. I'm not I'm not totally sure how bright, whether it will be sort of full moon during the day, brighter or what, but. Um, this is pretty rare. There have only been nine other daytime comets seen in the last 340 years. So if you're, you know, hoping for clear skies here, if you're in a place where you can see it, try to see it, because I don't know when we're going to get another one of these. Uh, maybe an astronomer out there does, anyone. Um, so, very briefly, the ones that we've seen before, in 1680, um, German astronomer Gottfried Kirsch was the first person to ever discover a comet by telescope. Um, and it, it was visible in Albany. There's re records of people in Albany, New York, having seen it on December 18th. And it was visible in the day uh, through early February of 19, or sorry, 19, 1681. Um, in 1744, there was a comet spotted in Switzerland that got steadily brighter as it approached the sun. And by early February, again, um, early throughout February, actually, it was visible during the day. Um, getting peak brightness as it approached the sun on March 1st. Um, 1843 um, is the first record that I was able to find of a group of comets called the Kreutz, oh god, I'm not pronouncing that right, uh, the Kreutz sun grazing comet group that are, they actually get close enough to the sun to dip into the, the very top layers of the sun. Um, and they are some of the brightest objects that we see as comets. Um, and one passed 126,000, sorry, 126, yeah, thousand miles from the sun's surface on February 27th, 1843. It was the Great Comet of 1843. Um, there was another comet from the Kreutz Sun Grazing Group in 1882 that was um, visible in September. All of these have been seen by like one person, so we need more people to see this one so we can verify it. Um, there were a bunch more recorded, and I don't know if this is just because people were more aware of comets or because detection techniques got better, but in the 20th century there were, f uh, I think, f yeah, four in the 20th century. Uh, one in 1910 was seen over South Africa. Um, late January it was visible during the day. Um, in 1927, oh god, another name, uh, <laughs> Comet Skellerup Maritani, I should have practiced this first, um, <laughs> was visible very uh, early December of 1927 and, and into a little bit the beginning of 1928. Um, there was another one Probably the most famous one, because it's one of the brightest, was Comet Ikea Seki in 1965. This was another of the Kreutz sun grazing group. Um, in o October of 1965, it passed within 744,000 miles of the center of the sun. That seems really close. Um, but it was one of the brightest objects seen during the day of the 20th century, which was pretty cool, but it also kind of eclipsed the one that came 10 years later in 1976, um, because it wasn't nearly as cool as the one everyone had seen 10 years before. Um, uh, Comet West, discovered by Danish astronomer Richard West, um, was seen during the day in February of 1976. And most recently, I did not see this one, nor was I aware of it to look uh, beforehand, was Comic McNaught, was discovered in Aug uh, sorry, August 2006 and was seen during the day in January uh, 2007. I actually think I, I saw, I think, Phil, I was at your place and you showed, I think it was Comic McNaught. I, I comic did, were you visiting then? Because I, I did, I saw Comic McNaught as well. It was... Yeah. Um, 
in broad daylight. I was out on a on a Sunday at like noon. I yeah. put the sun, it was very close to the sun, as it sort of has to be to be that bright. I put the sun behind sort of the eve of the roof of my house, and the comet was, boom, you, you couldn't miss it. It was mm-hmm. incredible. And it was, yeah. you know, noon, so it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. This- the time... <laughs> Sorry, the timing for this is going to be it's going to be a little bit tricky. If you download the data from the Minor Planet Eph- Ephemera Center for uh, for the comet and put it in uh, Stellarium, it you can track what the brightness is supposed to be based on current estimates, and it's really only about a an 18 hour window where the comet reaches a magnitude that has it visible during the day. So you really have to be, well for 18 hours is pretty good for this one, but for some of these others you know, it may have been an even shorter period of time. So you really had to be in the right part of the world and turned toward the sun um, to get the, the timing when it would have been bright enough to see during daylight. So, I mean people are still trying to figure out what the impact or like what effect this comet is going to is going to have is it going to be uh, you know a good comet I mean you know is it going to tear apart and be destroyed by the sun I guess that's one but but then you got the spectrum it's going to be pretty it's going to hold together really tight and not really flare up all the way to it's going to get really bright possibly the brightest comet in human history right so in in sort of you know recent history which is the most comets- out isn't very much of solar system history <laughs> yeah, yeah right yeah <laughs> and comets are just difficult to predict Kahootek was supposed to be huge and it fizzled out it just it yeah. depends on on how much uh, frozen stuff they have under the surface that can break out gas you know at carbon dioxide and water and that sort of thing and reflect sunlight and some of these things are awry and they get really close and then nothing happens. They just they dim and nobody notices them. There's no way to know until it happens. So just stay on top of this and keep your eyes open. I can guarantee though that the hype machine will build and build and build this year. It will just Absolutely. get louder and louder. And so either for people for will worse. look like they're really smart and they predicted a long time or uh, people will feel pretty stupid for suggesting that this comet will be bright when it's lame. So, But even if it does break up, it's not like it's going to do anything. That, but that that is interesting. I mean, yeah. Yes. No. I, this is. Um. I'm trying to that find in my in this article that I mentioned. There was one of these comets that broke up into six pieces and created like a fan looking tail, yeah. um, which would be really really cool to see. But it's not like this comet isn't going to break up and come attack us. It's not. It's not evil. So <laughs> it'll yeah. have tentacles come out. <laughs> so what's everybody's favorite tentacles. comet? What's your favorite comet that you've seen? Mine Isn't there was, one that turns which, your Is one that makes it, uh, My favorite was uh, was it Hayaku Hakutaki? Hakutaki. Hakutaki. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Hail Bob. You saw Hail Bob? I did say Hail Bob when I was a kid. I yeah. would have to. I would have to say McNaught just because I, I have video of it setting. I mean, it was it was so That's bright awesome. the day that I was I was filming it. You can actually watch it slip below the horizon. I oh. I've got to reprocess that and put that on on YouTube or something. So, um, but yeah, that was pretty pretty good. But Holmes, I know I was tracking Comet Holmes, and you could see it from Los Angeles. So right. hanging out over. Oh. Um, you know, downtown. I, I have pictures of it there in, in Perseus. So that's pretty cool to be able to see a naked eye comet like from LA. Well, that's, that's with yeah. me and wow. Hellbop. I yeah. could, it was the only interesting astronomical thing I could see from Staten Island, and yeah. that made me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we move on? Uh, Thad, you're going to talk about a uh, supernova precursor. Right, so this is a, uh, a study that's been done, uh, I believe it's by uh, the professor named Obeck, if I remember correctly, uh, <clears throat> who was using the Palomar Transient Factory. And so this isn't like a factory that's turning out transient events. It's scanning the sky repeatedly and looking for changes. Most of the, the interesting things we find in astronomy is a change from one time to another, and some of them are pretty quick, like a, a supernova. So <clears throat> this is using the 48-inch Schmidt uh, telescope on uh, Mount Palomar, and so they found a supernova. It was 2010 MC, was the name of the supernova. It's a type 2N supernova, meaning it's an explosion of a massive star at the end of its life. And the N means that there's hydrogen in the spectrum and it's a very narrow band of hydrogen. So what you have is kind of a thin cloud of of hydrogen gas that's around the star as the supernova goes out and hits it. You get this hydrogen emission, but it tends up to be a very narrow band. So what was found that was kind of interesting though is that scanning images from 40 days previous to the explosion, they could see an outburst of gas um, from this particular 
uh, progenitor star for, for the supernova. So it looks like it shed about like one one hundredth of the solar mass of, of hydrogen, but this could be found in an image 40 days previous to when the, the supernova appeared. So it's it's a possibility for looking for progenitors. I mean, I know one thing you see some astronomy memes going around that when I go out in the sky in the winter nights and look at Betelgeuse, all I can think is, when will you blow up? <laughs> so um, so this might be a way of telling. I mean, anytime you, you get one of these stars coming to the end of its life, it's puffing out solar wind, there's an enormous dump of material out into space. Um, as these stars reach the end of their life, they keep burning new shells, new elements, and it's hotter, and so they have to um, kind of re-equilibrate because of, of pumping out more energy. So you kind of get like these layers of stuff coming out. And so you know, maybe this is a way of finding that, hey, okay, that layer came out, that star is going to go supernova in a couple of weeks. So I think they've, they found this, and I think they found a few other is about to LSST will come online and we'll have much better, better data, much into the sky. We'll find far more candidates than what our current. I think you're breaking up. But is anyone else? Is it just me or is he? No, breaking I, I, up? yeah, he sounds like. Dalek. All right. All right, you've he's a Dalek. We have so a Poffins we, and we have a Dalek. <laughs> we have a Dalek. All right, so Alan, our Vulcan. Um, Alan, we're going to talk there about an go. asteroid, an asteroid pass that's coming very, very soon, and very, 20, very close. Yes, 2012 uh, DA14. It'll be coming in uh, below the level of uh, telecommunication satellites, which fly at uh, 22,000 miles in altitude. This will be uh, something like 17,200 miles in altitude. But don't worry, Earth is safe. Uh, they know the orbit of this thing so well that uh, there's no chance that uh, 2012 DA14 will uh, will hit the Earth when it makes its closest approach. That's going to be on February 15th at uh, 2.44 p.m. Eastern Time. So that's during daylight, uh, and uh, that means that people in North America might not get that great a view of what's going on. The peak viewing is going to be in uh, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Australia, but it's not going to be visible to the naked eye, even though it's coming really close, because it's not all that big. It's 150 feet uh, in diameter, and uh, so uh, you would need uh, binoculars or a small telescope in order to see it. And you'd have to know really where to look in your locale, because it's going to be moving pretty fast. It'll be making a path uh, equal to two times the width of the full moon, or a full degree, every minute. So, wow. uh, yeah, look fast. That's, yeah, I mean, that's not as fast as, say, when the International Space Station goes overhead, but it's still plenty fast. Yeah, Yeah, and if you need a big, the remember with the International Space Station, you can see that with your eye, and so it's pretty easy to follow it along. If you've got a, yeah. you know, a four-inch or six-inch telescope, uh, even, uh, it would take some doing in order to really find it and, and follow it. And I really haven't found any great information so far about exactly what the viewing uh, circumstances are going to be, and that could be because uh, it's so close that they will vary according to your location. Now, Nancy, we're working on a story for that, aren't we? Right. Uh, Dave yeah. Dickinson is going to be working on a story for us. We hope to publish it either over the weekend or on Monday, and that should have some good observing tips. And he's got a great graphic on uh, on it as well. All so, right. So Coming we attractions. Will, so we will provide that information for you, Alan. Your wish is our command. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how often do these kinds of short uh, approaches happen every year? Close well, uh, uh, for you know, uh, we get uh, something like uh, 50 to 100 tons of uh, asteroidal material hitting Earth every day. But that is, it depends on how big you're talking about. For things that are this big, something this big comes this close every 40 years or so, according to NASA. And uh, something that big hits the Earth every, say, 1,200 years or so. So. Uh, it really depends. Size is everything when it comes to asteroids. Well, I mean, would this be a Tunguska if it hit? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very. Uh, really? Tunguska, it's Tunguska size. It's made of the same sort of stuff that people think that the Tunguska object was made out of. And in case you're not an asteroid impact geek, 
Tunguska was this big, uh, this big uh, impact that happened in 1908 over the Siberian forest. They believed that there was an air burst equivalent to a 2.5 megaton at atomic bomb that went off and leveled millions of trees over something like 800 square miles of area. Not too many people there, though, so I guess we were okay. But uh, it's a cautionary, it's a cautionary tale. Do we have an estimate on the density for uh, this asteroid? Actually, they don't know a whole lot about uh, the composition of this asteroid. They think it is a stony asteroid. Uh, there was some talk about unpublished, unpublished data that uh, suggests that this is an L-type asteroid. And I don't, you know, um, then we're getting down into the weeds as far as I'm concerned. But apparently, L-type asteroids are relatively rare. Uh, but uh, that's, that's about all they know, but they will know more because they'll be tracking this asteroid as it comes through. Uh, they'll have Goldstone and uh, the Arecibo radio telescopes watching it. Most of the good radar imagery will not be coming out until after the close encounter. That's when they'll be getting the best uh, imagery from this encounter. Because if I remember correctly, the Barringer meteor crater was estimated to have been uh, caused by about a 50 meter object, although I believe that was an iron. Yes, right. that, that's exactly so. the difference. The, that came up during yesterday's press briefing is that the Behringer meteorite was an iron nickel meteorite. And so even though it's the same size as uh, the Tunguska object or, or this 2012 DA-14, it could auger right into the ground because uh, it was so much denser. Wow. And something else interesting about these detections, I mean, now we have many more eyes on the sky than we used to. So I re remember when 2000, uh, 2005 YU55 came by in November, uh, November 8th of November 8th, November 9th of 2011. And so that was a 1300 um, foot or about 400 meter object. Um, so much bigger and also approaching within one lunar diameter. So I think maybe the thing is now because we're able to search for asteroids so much better than we could in the past, we're, we're seeing more of these close passes that they've been going on for a very long time. It's just now we're, we're able to track them better and be able to see more of them. Right. I think Don Yeomans from NASA said that 10 years ago we probably wouldn't have uh, detected this sort of object. So things have come along quite a way since then. That's uh, that. So um, you can just imagine what kind of impact it would have if it would hit, but it won't hit. But the I mean, it really shows off the necessity of these kinds of programs to find these objects and predict their paths and trajectories a long time in advance, so that if any are on a dangerous trajectory, we have an opportunity to try and. Um, sort of move them out of the way. Now, I know with like Apophis, right, there was the situation where it was going to, you know, the worry was that it might at some point go through this keyhole, get its, you know, gravity, right. you know, its path get affected by the gravity, and then it wouldn't, it wouldn't hit this time, but maybe on a future uh, orbit it might come back around. Do you, do you know if there's any risk for this, or is this, this rock yes. completely safe? Yes. Um, the, the, it's actually the reverse for this rock is that it has been coming closer to Earth. It has a period somewhere around a year, and so, uh, so uh, with this uh, go round. Earth's gravitational field will perturb the orbit enough so that it knocks it into a more, uh, you know, uh, a shorter orbit that is safer for Earth. So in this case, Earth's gravitational field is our best friend. Um, so we've got one question here from uh, Russell Bateman asks, uh, uh, I guess, is there any interaction? What if it interacts with the geosynchronous satellite? Could that be a problem for us? I mean, yeah. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, that's a that's a concern. It's an extremely remote possibility that uh, that there would be some sort of interaction. I, I talked with the satellite uh, experts on this, and they said that there's the only real way that it could affect that this sort of asteroid could affect uh, a satellite is if it hit the satellite, and uh, that's extremely unlikely. It would have to do it on the way coming in or going out. And uh, so NASA is sharing the orbital data with satellite operators just so that they know what the score is and they can take whatever action they feel they might need to take. But really, there are bigger threats to satellites than this one out there, like other satellites. Like each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and I got a question here from R.D. Brewer on YouTube. Has anyone seen a bolide? Which sure. is a sort of, yeah, have, has people seen them? Mm -hmm. Go sure. for it. Several. 
Yeah, I haven't seen one. Really? I've seen like a really bright meteor, meteor, but I haven't seen like a, you know, a fizzling, crackling one that stays up there for a, you a know, trail a, sticks around. a trail and you see it, a, you know, a minute Usually later, I it's still them. a trail. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I saw one during a kegger or during a high school reunion, but I, I can't be sure. Usually yeah. I miss them because I'm setting up the telescope, so my head's looking down and the students are all like, ah! Yeah, yeah I miss it. <laughs> I see um... Cool. Well, I think. Uh, oh, it looks like Alan uh, Curlin has found uh, 3D glasses on eBay, the ones that I was talking about. So, 99 cents. How on earth can they afford that with free shipping? So I, I have no idea. <laughs> I just pick them up at conferences, the cardboard yeah. ones. Yeah. And save them. They pile up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great. Well, I think we're. I think we can kind of wrap things up. So before we wrap things up, though, uh, how do we find out more of uh, of all of this good science journalistness? So, Alan, where do we find more about you? Cosmiclog.com would be a good place to start. You can just look uh, and uh, NBCnews.com and go to the space or the science section, and you'll find what I'm doing every day. Uh, Amy, share your title. Uh, you can go to amyshearttitle.com for my blog, Vintage Space, and uh, Discovery News, Motherboard, Google Plus is a good place to start. Yeah, yeah, you've got a lot of stories. You're a very prolific freelancer. Yes. And Nancy Atkinson, where do we find out more about this universe today? Uh -huh. On Universe Today. And you can see me there. I'm on Google Plus, Twitter, and all that. And I did want to mention one uh, kind of news story that came out this week is that NASA is going to have their first Google Plus Hangout um, on February 22nd, and it's going to be at 11 a.m. Eastern. So, uh, in space station hangout, right? I mean, yes, from yeah, the space live station. It's going to be live from with the space astronauts. Station. Yeah, so you can ask questions. So uh, get your questions ready and. And, I'm totally going to send in a question. I yeah. think of a good one. How do you poop in space? No, they probably had that one a lot. Probably. Yeah. A Mary lot. Roach writes a whole chapter about that. I know, I know. <laughs> it's like, from what I hear, that's what I hear from the astronauts is they, like, that's the top question everybody wants to know. How do you, How do you go to the bathroom up there? So, uh, Nicole Gallucci, where do we find out more... Uh, Noisy. I live at noisyastronomer.com, and you can get links to everything I do with CosmoQuest, uh, Discovery News, and Skeptic. And I think I'm listing all the things that I do. Yeah, so go check me out there. Oh, and and my Google Plus profile migration seems to have gone okay. So I thank you for following me. You did that. That is a yeah. dangerous thing. <laughs> it is dangerous. Yeah, the the posts haven't moved, but the circles have, and the people are the most important part. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Phil Plate. Where do we find out more Phil Plate? Uh, you can look me up on badastronomy.com. That'll take you to my blog that is hosted by Slate Magazine, slate.com. And I will say that I'm starting a new thing with my friend Karen Bondar, who is a biologist. She does weekly science wrap-ups with Science Alert, which is an Australian news place. I see everybody laughing. I know a lot of you met her at uh, Science yeah. Online. Yeah, she directed yeah. the Gangnam Style video. Oh, I can't wait for yeah. to yeah. Out. yeah, she's yeah. a handful. Uh, I like her. And uh, she does a wrap-up of the science news for the week with science alerts. And I'll be throwing in a couple of minute thing about a favorite astronomy story from that week as well. That's going Sunday, but I'll have links to it on my blog. So just, uh, you know, pay attention and you'll see. I That's fantastic. And that's it, but where do we uh, where do we find out more of that? So well um I talked to Dr. Pamela Gay and I should be um jo doing more stuff with CosmoQuest soon and still looking for um places to, to spend things. But I mean right now if you want to take a course at Cerritos College, uh <laughs> Uh, that's that's mostly where you can find me. Do you have do you have room? Actually, we I mean you're you mainly join us every Sunday night on the, uh, the on the virtual star party, which is great, and you bring the science, and that's uh, a real treat. So if you want to hear Thad go at length about all of the, uh, the the objects that we're looking at, it's uh, that's a great way to hear him. Uh, okay, so the next thing that we're doing. Uh, so it's wait, Friday, wait, where so can we find you, Fraser? We find you, I mean, also at Universe today, okay. and Google Plus, and on the virtual star party, and everywhere. So. Um, right, so the next thing up is going to be the virtual star party. That's uh, Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast. We will hook up a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and show you the night sky. We'll take requests and uh, explain what we're looking at and to give you tips and tricks and gear and all that. So, uh, so join us Sunday night. And have a little fun. Do, 
and have a lot of fun. I, you know, you kids were crazy last week. I watched oh, you it. Saw that? I watched it. Yeah, you, you, you guys were oh, off the party. hook. Yeah, it was quite a party. The dad was away, and the yeah, it was, it was great, great show. And actually, so many objects. Last week it was amazing. How many amazing objects you guys got through? So it was a, it was a real treat. Anyway, uh, we'll just wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, uh, and we will see you all next week on the weekly space hangout. Bye, everybody. My phone just started ringing. <laughs>